Is that all working? Sam, you can see it. Oh, I don't know. Thanks. Yeah, I think I am going to I don't. <laughs> it's uh, as part of for yeah. I have to. Yes. Okay. I'll buy lunch. Just <laughs> about it. What's that? Can you join in Vex? Yeah, people are joining now. They can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Get the screen there. I don't know how to use WebEx. Um, no. Hello. Barat Masuga. Barat is loud, isn't it? Yeah, I can hear fine. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Someone may be the co host, though. I, I, I don't know why. Oh, you are the co host. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that away. The first meeting in person. <laughs> He joined Yoshi, so the by mistake I did. But I, I'm doing it. Yeah, I made the Jansner uh, co host. I thought he's uh, Jain Yoshi. His name was uh, <laughs> <laughs> only Jain. So, uh, hello, so, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, uh, WebEx was acting up again. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I think maybe okay. Like when questions come in, maybe. Ravi, you are back. Yeah, I'm just come. <laughs> so we're shooting for uh, one hour. Is that what we're trying to do? Yeah, about.
Thank <laughs> <laughs> Um, welcome everybody. This is the first uh, in in person meeting after a, after a seminar after a long time. Um, it's my great pleasure to have uh, Nick McDowell today's speaker, and uh, he was visiting IA last one week, and I think he's here for another day. Um, so anyone who wants to talk to him, uh, feel free to discuss with him. Sits in the first row. Um, he also stays in the guest house. Maybe breakfast time, if you just bump in, just uh, speak to him. He is an expert in uh, fibers. So Nick started his. Uh, he's uh, he graduated as a mechanical engineer in 1999. He started into uh, started into astronomy as uh, engineering, ignited detonator scope at NASA in Hawaii. Uh, then he moved to University of Washington, uh, where he was involved in the SDSL survey. He was the main person for the fiber instrument. He also was involved in the Apache Bank Observatory upgrades. Uh, later, he moved to PCO. Right? Yeah, in 2014, he moved to yeah he moved to you know, University of California Observatories. Where that's when he came to know about Nick. He was deeply involved in the uh, the project management for both the TMP instruments as well as the Trick instruments. And uh, one of which uh, India was involved was the uh, wide field optical spectrograph. And, uh, and currently, we are also involved in one of the Trick instruments development. It's really a pleasure to have Nick. Um, so, so we would hear more from Nick on these two instruments and uh, that to Nick. So nice to have you here. Thank you for uh, for having me. Um, just start that timer. So as uh, Shivarani mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the development efforts for next generation instruments at the, the Keck facility. Um, these are mostly development efforts that are ongoing at uh, the University of California Observatories. I'll start with a quick overview of uh, the two telescopes, and then we'll talk about some of the projects that we're, that we're working on in, in Santa Cruz. And then I want to talk about two projects, specifically the SCALES instrument, uh, which is a collaboration with IIA, and then the Phobos uh, instrument, which is another project that I'm managing for, for UC Santa Cruz. Is the audio okay? Okay, so this is the Keck telescope. Um, it's a nice overview from the CAD, and it's just to give you an idea of uh, what the, the observatory looks like. Um, primarily, it's an ace plus beams telescope, so we use the uh, we have the, uh, the AO enclosure back here where we, we have all of our AO bench and all of our AO instrumentation. And then we have a C limited platform right here where all the C limited instruments are. Keck has two telescopes on Mauna Kea. They're nearly identical with some subtleties as to the differences in how the AO systems operate and to the, uh, the number of available ports on any given lake. Uh, so this is the full list of instrumentation that is currently available on the Keck telescope uh, as of uh, this semester. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole list. I can leave it up for those that are interested in Keck instrumentation at the end. 
but I want to point out uh, a couple of things. So this this LRIS instrument, this this first line here, this was the first instrument delivered to CAC uh, along with Pyres, and uh, over on the on the very far right hand side is the delivery dates for all of these instruments. And one thing you'll notice is this is approaching the 30 year old set of instrumentation. Uh, if you scan down the list, a number of these instruments are uh, roughly 20 years old. We have upgraded them over the years to try and keep them as current as possible, but at some point uh, technology advances further than you can, you can advance the, uh, the, the instruments that exist. So one of the things we're doing at uh, UC observatories and kind of a Keck collaboration, which includes Caltech and all of the University of California campuses, is trying to modernize this set of instrumentation. So whenever we start an instrument project, we, um, we try to make sure that uh, the capabilities of a new instrument replace existing capabilities of an old instrument. We've, we've filled up all of the deck space at Keck Observatory, so we have to we have to remove an instrument anytime we bring a new one. So uh, these are the three instruments that are likely to be removed when the Scales project and the Phobos project are in completion. Uh, the first two, LRIS and DMOS, uh, Phobos will replace both of the capabilities of these instruments, but it will also um, extend to a much higher multiplexing range and a, uh, a much better uh, instrument transmission. Uh, NERC-2 is kind of the premier AO uh, thermal infrared instrument for Keck Observatory right now. Uh, SCALES is expected to replace all of the characteristics of NERC-2 and extend those to a couple of um, kind of interesting regimes. It's, SCALES is a uh, integral field instrument at high contrast, um, so it'll, it'll, it'll repeat NERC-2's capabilities and add a few new capabilities. All right, so this is kind of a plan view looking down onto the Keck-1 telescope. The instruments available at Keck-1 are LRIS, IRES, OSIRIS, and MOSFIRE. Keck-1 can actually use all of these instruments on any given night. Uh, so we have the, the AO enclosure off to the right-hand side over here. Uh, OSIRIS is always permanently mounted to the AO bench, so you can use it any night Keck is on sky. We have a port that is open where we can slot in uh, a number of instruments. Uh, that can use the, the same AO bench. And then Keck-1 is a bit unique in that it has a deployable tertiary mirror. About five years ago, we uh, replaced the, the tertiary mirror, which used to be able to rotate between the nasal platforms to allow access to two instruments with a deployable tertiary that could move out of beam, giving us access to the CAS port. So uh, MOSFIRE is uh, kind of permanently mounted on the CAS port of Keck-1. And then high res is on the scene limited platform. So you can have any of these four instruments on a, on a given night. Keck 2 is quite a lot more crowded in terms of instrumentation. We have uh, near spec, uh, near res, NERC 2, uh, DMOS, KCWI, and ESI. Um, the, the deployable tertiary on Keck 1, we needed to limit the field of view to about 10 arc minutes in order to make that deployable tertiary work. So we've not installed one on CAC 2 in order to maintain the full 20 arc minute field of view that's available from the secondary mirror of the CAC telescope. Uh, so again, we have a manual enclosure on uh, the right hand side of this image where NERC 2 is permanently mounted. Scales when it's delivered to the telescope will slot into this port to mate up to the AO bench. And we expect after an integration period we will then move scales over to the permanent position and uh, replace replacement. Um, the the Keck Science Steering Committee will make that decision after they've uh, had enough time to analyze data crossover between the two the two instruments. Uh, Phobos is going to live over here on the Naismith platform, the, the scene limited Naismith platform, and then you have all the park positions for all of the instruments here. Uh, the park positions are pretty well full up, so we'll have to remove DMOS from the telescope when, uh, when Phobos arrives. Okay, so this is just a cartoon kind of showing where Keck's instrumentation lands in terms of its wavelength coverage and uh, multiplexing. Keck uh, really splits instruments into two kinds. We have visible instruments and infrared instruments, with the breakpoint being around one micron. Uh, the invisible instruments can go all the way down to about 310 nanometers with uh, LRIS. 
uh, and then the, the infrared instruments start at one micron and extend all the way out to five, five microns, depending upon the instrument that we're talking about. For the most part, tech is really a single object facility. Most of these instruments down here are meant for going extremely deep on a, on a single object. Uh, we have a few higher multiplexing instruments, but the highest multiplex instrument is really DMOS at um, an average um, multiplexing of around 20. It really depends upon the field that you're looking at and how you set up the it's a slit mask instrument. So it depends upon where the slits land on the on the slit mask as to what the multiplexing of, of DMOS will be. So when we bring uh, scales and Phobos online, scales is going to sit down here and extend from uh, one micron out to two microns out to five microns, replacing all the characteristics of NERC2 and adding a couple of new uh, capabilities. There's an imaging channel available on scales. Uh, it will also be a high contrast system. It's got a coronagraph so for suppressing starlight uh, so that we can, we can try to directly image exoplanets. Phobos is really a large change for the observatory. So DMOS is down here at around 20 objects. Uh, Phobos is a fiber fed system with 1800 individual fibers roaming the focal plane. And it pushes tech into uh, a new regime in terms of multiplexing, which is going to require quite a lot of changes to the facility and the operation of CAC to, to figure out how to make that work. Okay, so here's kind of the, all of the instruments that are in the pipeline at UC observatories. We're not necessarily leading all of these instruments, but we have some system that we're delivering for them. Uh, all of the instruments are led by either uh, a University of Campus, University of California campus, or by um, Caltech, uh, and then CACAX is a, is a third partner in that, in that arrangement. So KCRM is an instrument that we are just finishing up. We expect to ship our component of that in about a week. This is a cryostat and detector package, which will go to Caltech for integration onto the uh, KCRM system. Scales is one of the projects that I am the project management pool, project manager for at uh, UC, and we're expecting to ship in 2025. We're currently in the final design phase. Uh, IAA is a, is a large partner in, in this development effort. LIGER is a project ran out of uh, University of California, San Diego. Our part of that is really the optical design from uh, Randy Kupke, and we're funding dependent, but we'll, we'll, we expect to ship it by the end of the decade. Phobos is led by UC Santa Cruz and UCO, and we're currently in our preliminary design phase. It's a large number of partners, mostly because it's such a large uh, system, and we're expecting to ship by about 2029. And then lastly, we have this project. It's called the Adaptive Secondary Mirror. Uh, Phil Hens joined UCO about uh, three years ago, and his interest is in large format deformable mirrors. So we're expecting to deploy a deformable mirror on at least one of the telescopes sometime in the 2030s. Uh, we're gonna go for funding probably in the next round of NSF calls in uh, September of, of next year. And uh, that, will, that will allow two things for CAC. It'll get us a uh, much better performance out of our AO system. So our AO instruments will, will, will get much better transmission efficiencies. Uh, we also will uh, have a ground layer adaptive optics system at that point, which will give our seeing and other instruments quite a boost in, in terms of their um, spatial resolution. So these are the two instruments that um, we're leading out of uh, UCO, and they're the two that I'll, that I'll spend a bit of time talking about. Okay, so back to the telescope. Um, Stale sits in the AO enclosure over here. This is a thermally regulated environment. Uh, the AO bench and enclosure already exist, so we're just mating that to their, their current AO system. And then this is Phobos sitting on the, uh, the nascent platform. This is the stack of spectrographs that are associated with Phobos. Um, it is a static system that does not come on and off of the telescope. So DMOS will need to be retired in order to make room for these spectrographs. Uh, this is the forward module of focal plane for Phobos, which is going to have to come on and off of the telescope because all these other instruments are going to want to use that. Uh, okay, so starting with uh, scales, these, these projects are large. There's no single institution that can build them on their own, so we tend to try and build large partnerships for, for CAC instruments. Uh, it's, it's primarily with the, uh, with the UC system and Caltech. 
Uh, in this case, IA has joined the project as well. So um, University of California, Irvine is developing the, uh, the data reduction package. This is led by Steph Salon and her group. Uh, the Indian Institute of Astrophysics is delivering the uh, imaging channel for scales, as well as a number of baseline modules. This is led by uh, Rolindo Banyal. And then uh, UC Santa Cruz is, is uh, leading the rest of the instrument modules and kind of managing the project. And when UCLA is, is coming online with uh, the detector package, uh, this is led by Mike Fitzgerald in this group. Okay, so the, the special, these are kind of the specifications for scales at a high level. We're offering three modes. We have an imaging mode, a low resolution spectroscopy mode, and then a, I guess, a medium resolution spectroscopy mode. In the imaging mode, we're going to span the full range of wavelengths that our detector allows, about two microns out to uh, 5.2 microns with uh, 20 filters. The 20 filters is really to match the requirement from for, to uh, uh, to duplicate the, the uh, capabilities of NERC2. It's not clear what filters are actually going to be deployed in scales. The Keck Science Steering Committee will decide that at some point. Field of view is going to be around 13 by 13 arc seconds with a spatial sampling of about uh, 0.01 arc seconds. The optics are diffraction limited. Uh, this uh, 12 milli arc seconds is really the micro sampling of the detector. In all of these modes, we are behind the Keck AO bench, and so we're getting a, a, a very nicely corrected beam. We're using a vortex coronagraph in any of these modes for starlight rejection. And then, uh, depending on whether it's the imaging channel or the, res the uh, spectroscopy channel, we have either a Leo stop or a, uh, a cold stop. The imaging channel uses, whoops. The imaging channel uses the, uh, the cold stop and uh, the uh, spectrographs are going to use a selectable Leo stop mechanism so you can change the, uh, the, the Leo stop that is inside the, the instrument. In the low resolution mode, we're using a slit based, uh, slit -lit -based IFU system. So um, the spectral bands and the resolution are, are really quite short. Um, these are really targeted at uh, identifying planets, so it's, it's, uh, it's low resolution and uh, very specific wavelength ranges. We do get a fairly large AO field of view at 2.2 by 2.2 arc seconds, and then we have a spatial sampling at about uh, 0.02 arc seconds. That's set by the pitch of the lens of the rays in the, in the IFU. The medium resolution mode, we can, we can swap the, to, over to the medium resolution mode and view a much smaller region of the lens lit array, and this allows us to uh, reformat the back end of the lens lit array and disperse across the full length of the detector, giving us much higher spectral resolution, but at a, a much smaller field of view. So we'll have three bands in medium resolution mode, K, L, and M, at resolutions of 6,000, 2,000, 3,000, uh, and at a small field of view of 0.36 by 0.34 arc seconds. Same spatial sampling, and again, we're still behind the VAO system. So um, this is where scales is intended to stack up with um, other instruments that, of its kind. Uh, GPI on Gemini is currently the best high contrast um, imaging system available at a contrast of about uh, 10 to the 5. Scales isn't going to quite reach that contrast level, but we span a very different wavelength range. We go really into the thermal infrared with some overlap to GPI. The thermal infrared is the chosen wavelength for scales because that's where the, um, the planets that we're interested in peak in luminosity. We're looking for fairly cold planets uh, that, are, um, that, are, that are small and uh, rocky, and that's when they peak at around 4 microns. So that's, that's why we push it so low. The spectral resolution is fairly complementary to both OSIRIS and GPI. We have some overlap in the blue side. And then we extend out to uh, to five microns, so it should be a, a good addition to Mauna Kea. All right, so I said there was a lenslet based IFU system. So how this works in the low resolution mode, uh, we'll have a candidate star that we don't necessarily know where the planet is within the field of view. Uh, it's been identified by other observational techniques. So what we will do is we will center the star on the lenslet array. The star has already had most of its light suppressed, 
and then we can hunt for the planet at low resolution within this uh, larger 2.2 arc second field of view. So if the planet has a separation of say less than 1.1 arc seconds, we'll be able to see it inside of this inside of this lens a little ray. And then we can switch modes. Once we know where the planet is, we can uh, send a stage with a blocker in to um, block the low resolution lens little array and show the uh, high resolution lens little array and then move the planet over to that uh, small subregion with a tip tilt mirror that is inside the instrument. And once the planet is on this, um, this, this zone, we can send it through a image reformatting system to give us high resolution spectroscopy on just the planet. And that allows us to uh, look for um, particularly molecular uh, absorption lines of the planet atmosphere. So um, it's the, the integral field spectroscopy is done in, in somewhat of a new way. This is probably the most novel part of the scales instrument. There's two typical ways to do AO integral field uh, spectrographs. The, the first and most common is a, is a lenslet based system. So you put a lenslet array at focus and you, you focus this down onto uh, spots, which you then disperse with a, with a prism. If you rotate that prism by about 15 degrees, you can get rather short uh, traces on your detector at uh, somewhat low resolution. So there's an order blocking filter uh, that keeps, say, this trace from overlapping with its neighboring trace. And, and that's how we, we do, that's how we use our instrument in the, uh, in the low resolution mode. In the higher resolution mode, we're using a slicer reformatter. So um, this is another way that you can build a, an IFS is to take, at the focal plane, you, you lay down a series of stacked mirrors that are at slightly different angles. And that sends uh, each slice off to the collimator at a, at, a, at a different angle so that they don't overlap when they land on the detector. That allows you to disperse along the full length of the detector. The downside of that is you get spatial information in one direction only, and you're fairly limited in the number of slices that you can do. So Dino Stelter, the instrument scientist for scales, has come up with this method that combines a uh, lenslet array with the slicer. Uh, he's calling it a, a slenslet. And uh, at the back end of the lenslet array, we put in a fold mirror that then directs a subset of the spots to a re-imaging system that reformats those spots into a linear pseudo slit. And then we disperse those across the full length of the, the H2OG detector. Uh, so by doing that, we can maintain the uh, 0.02 arc second resolution of the lenslet array uh, and, and, and also get to a much higher dispersion to the trade is, is lower field of view. Okay, so this is scales when, it, when it's sitting on the, on the telescope. So the beam from the Keck tertiary is coming in from the top of the, uh, of the image. We intersect with the K mirror here and then go into our AO system. This is the deformable mirror that uh, corrects the, the field. And then uh, the wavefront sensor sits right here. So in our original deployment, when we first get to the observatory, we will sit in this port, which we call the vent port. And we have to insert a dichroic into beam right here. And that directs all of the thermal light to scales and sends the near IR light over to the pyramid wavefront sensor, which sits right here. Um, there's a strong preference to use this port eventually for scales because there's a small non-common non path there that's induced by this dichroic. So at some point, uh, once after scales is commissioned, uh, the, the CAC SSC will get together and decide whether they're willing to retire NERC 2 and move scales to, to this position. Uh, a couple other things about the AO bench. This module here is going to be new. This is a, a calibration system that is uh, going to be deployed for scales. It involves a monochrometer for scanning through individual wavelengths and then a telescope um, simulator that injects a beam via a pickoff mirror straight into the cable. This is a module that's being designed and delivered by, by IIA. Okay, so here's kind of the, the guts of the scales instrument. We've broken the optics modules into, into four uh, individual categories. There's the, what we call the forward optics in this bluish box. Uh, there is the imaging channel, which is, which is down here in this box. This is the high resolution image slicer. 
And then this is the spectrograph and low resolution channel. So I'll start in the forward optics. We go through a cryostat window right here. After we cross that boundary, uh, all of the optics are reflective until the lens load array, and they are at cryogenic temperatures and, and in vacuum. So from the, from the door window, we uh, go into some reformatting optics, which give us a pupil plane right here. This is where we put our uh, first cold stop that's needed for the imager. It's a rotating cold stop. It's being designed by uh, Anjan Karakesh. And then right after the cold stop is a, is a 20 uh, filter filter wheel. It's a double stack uh, filter wheel, which is going to be designed by Ari Mohan fairly soon. Uh, from there, we go into a number of other reformatting optics, which give us a pupil, or sorry, give us a focal plane right here. And this, we have a linear selector stage, which gives us an option of five different coronagraphic masks that we can we can put into this uh, this focal plane. Oh, sorry, this focal plane right here. Uh, from there, we go into a, a wheel that gives us an opportunity to put in a number of different Leo stops. Um, for all of the spectroscopic modes, uh, those are um, masks, which we, we transmit light through. When we want to use scales and imaging mode, this wheel rotates into it rotates a, 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 a fold mirror into place, which allows us to fold the beam back to a imaging channel, which has uh, been designed by our demo awesome. So the, the fold inserts here. And we go back into uh, a set of optics. This is a little convenience. This is a shaped optic. And then we land on the focal plane here. Uh, if we're using it in spectroscopic mode, we go through the Leo stop and then we go to our steering mirror. This is the mirror that allows us to uh, push the planet around on the lens little ring. It also allows us to maintain the stability on, of the planet on the high resolution array when we're using the high resolution spectrograph. From these are just simple folds, and then we get to our, our lens load array, which, which lands right here. The lens load array, the mechanics of lens load array have been designed again by Engine. At that point, we can, we can take two different paths. In low resolution mode, we go directly through to a pair of optics that act as our collimator, and then to a, uh, a, a prism, which will sit right here. We have any number of prisms. We have about six prisms in this, in this mechanical carousel that sit over here. Uh, depending upon the, um, the passband that we're interested in. And then we go into a pair of optics that act as our, as our camera and then down onto the detector. Directly in front of the detector is this uh, filter wheel mechanism, which can slot in any number of uh, any, any one of 12 individual filters um, for, for, uh, for defining the passband that lands in the detector. The, this filter wheel has been designed by Harvey. When we're in the high resolution mode, we slot, there's a, there's a stage that's a little bit difficult to see right, right here, that slots a fold in behind the high resolution array. At the same time, it puts a blocker in front of the low resolution array uh, so that we can take the very difficult uh, detour path through the slum, what, what Dino's calling the slums. So there is a stacked slicer here. There's a couple of, uh, uh, people mirror arrays right here, and after going through all of these optics, we are now reformatted from a from a two D array to a to a linear array for input into the uh, into the spectrograph itself. Uh, there's another fold at the back end of the lens lit array that uh, is at the same apparent position as the as the lens lit array, which gives us the ability to use the same spectrograph. Although this time, instead of a, a prism, we slot in a uh, a grating into the into the, into the carousel, which gives us the longer dispersion path. So there ends up being about seven moving modules in a cryogenic environment. So it's a fairly challenging system uh, on the mechanical. OK, I'm going to switch to uh, the Phobos instrument. Is there any questions about the scales design before we move on? Yeah. Sorry. How heavy? Um, so our mass limit is 5,000 pounds. That's the most that we can put on. Where it's not bent Cassegrain, it's Naismith. So let me go back here. So this is the, this bent port is a 
It's called bent because it has a dichroic and so it inserts on the AO batch. But this sits in a gravity invariant environment on the basement platform. Yeah, it's it's odd that it's called bent because it seems pretty straight to me, but Keck calls it bent. Okay, so the Phobos instrument, we were over here in the AO enclosure um, with the scales instrument, and we swing around to the other side where we deploy the Phobos um, instrument. Um, it's actually kind of nice that we're building both of these instruments for one telescope because it means we're not confusing them. Okay. Uh, we don't have to. We don't have to try and maintain two CAD models in the telescope uh, right now. We're only working with one of the telescopes. So uh, Phobos is 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 a beast. It's a large instrument that takes up quite a lot of room on the basement platform. Uh, currently, there are three park positions, one in beam and then two out of beam on this platform. Uh, we're going to need to take up an entire park position with just the spectrograph bank. Uh, so that's what really drives us to needing to retire DMOS as soon as, uh, as, soon as Phobos shows up at the telescope. Uh, the forward module uh, is really the complicated part of the instrument. It's where all the moving parts are. It's where the fiber positioning system is. Okay, so Phobos, uh, like Scales, is a large team of institutions. Um, it's an even larger team because it's a it's a much more complex instrument than, than Scales. So, um, University of California Observatories and Santa Cruz are are leading the effort. the The management team is made up of Kevin Bundy, who's in uh, UC Santa Cruz, Kyle Westfall, uh, Kevin's the PI, Kyle's the project scientist. And then I'm the, the project manager at uh, UC Observatories. We're both on the same campus. Space Sciences Lab in Berkeley is delivering the fiber system for Phobos. This is led by Claire Poppet and her group. Claire Poppet, be a deco. That's okay. So Claire Poppet and, uh, and and her group uh, built all of the fiber systems for the DESI instrument. Uh, and they've also worked on a few other fiber fiber deployments. So we, we expect the fiber system will not be an issue. Uh, Australian Astronomical Optic is uh, is is AAO. This is the, the group in Australia that's designed the Starbucks positioning system. They're delivering the robotic focal plane for Phobos. Um, this is work led by Celestina uh, Lacombe, but she's got a large team of engineers working with her. Um, AAO has deployed this system on, uh, on the AAT in the term in the form of the Taipan instrument. So Starbucks have been developed, under development for about 15 years. And I think the technology is now mature enough that we can, we can think about baselining the big instrument on Starbucks. Keck Observatory is going to have to change quite a lot about the uh, Naismith platform for Phobos to fit onto the telescope. Uh, so they, are, they have a pretty big uh, engineering work package. And then these three groups, uh, Berkeley Labs, Carnegie Mellon, University of Washington, and IPAC are, are leading the data initiative for Phobos. Kyle Westfall is, is, the, uh, is in charge of that system. Uh, this includes the targeting, targeting design, um, the, how we translate that into uh, positions on the focal plane, uh, data collection, the instrument simulator, the data reduction pipeline, as well as data service. IPAC is really the group that does data service for CAC. Um, these high multiplexing systems, they're, they're really as much of a software project as they are a, uh, a, a instrument project. So this, this four group institution, these four institutions make up about half of the effort associated with this. Hong Kong University is a partner. Rinbin Yen uh, is leading the calibration effort for Phobos, so he's, he's designed a, uh, an onboard calibration system that we can talk about a little bit. Okay, so um, here's Phobos again on the observing deck, uh, and these are kind of the highlights of the instrument parameters. So field of view is 20 arc minutes. That's the maximum field of view that you can get through the CAC telescope. The spectrographs, we're using, a th we're using three four-channel spectrographs. We're calling them DESI-like because they are uh, refractive cameras that are relatively similar to the DESI design, although at a higher resolution and, um, and number of channels. 
wavelength range, we go all the way down to 310 nanometers and out to a micron at a resolution of 3,500. Total number of the fibers in the system is about 1,800. And uh, that can be changed into a number of different operational modes. We can use uh, single fiber MOS mode, uh, multi-object spectroscopy. We can use multi-object IFU mode, so we have deployable IFUs that we can move around on the focal plane, or we can use one large monolithic IFU. And the positioning system, again, is, is, is using Starbucks. So um, we have to have a break in the fiber train to allow the forward module to be removed from the uh, observing platform when other instruments are, are using the, 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 the beam. So that gives us an opportunity to implement uh, mode selection. So at the same point where we plug in the connector for the, uh, for coming off of the telescope, we can plug into one of three ports. So any spectrograph can be operating in one of these three modes. And these numbers are associated with just one spectrograph. So one spectrograph will have 572 fibers dedicated to single fiber observations. Um, it's not 600 because there's a there's a section there's a number of the fibers that we hold in reserve for uh, to work production. Uh, they they use these little seven fiber mini bundles that they place on standard stars. So out of this 572 fibers, the user can choose their number that they're using for, say, sky subtraction, and the number that they're putting on astronomical targets. We can uh, switch modes to these uh, 37 fiber IFUs. Every spectrograph can deploy about 14 of these IFUs on sky. Those integral field units represent about 5.6 arc seconds across the flats for each of them. Uh, or we can deploy in uh, large IFU mode. When all the spectrographs are plugged into the large IFU, we get one IFU that is roughly 40 arc seconds across at, uh, and it is uh, about 1,657 fibers. The balance to 1,800 is uh, dedicated to sky and to the correction unit. So, uh, depending upon the observer, you can mix and match these modes. You can have some uh, single fiber MOS, some uh, uh, IFUs, or uh, you can you can deploy the spectrographs all on one of these. Okay, so I'm going to start with the the front end module. This is really where all of the um, the difficult things are happening, uh, and then we'll go to the, the fiber system and finally the, the spectrographs. So. It, the system's a bit complicated, so I'm just going to walk through a series of slides and show how the light propagates through the instrument. So we're getting our beam from the tertiary mirror, which is sitting over here in the middle of the telescope. It comes to the Naismith platform. We go through a, the first two elements of our uh, ADC. This is a compensating lateral ADC that I'll talk about a little bit more uh, in a few slides. We hit a fourth mirror. This fourth mirror is really intended to deliver a horizontal focal plane for the Starbug actuation system. Um, AAO deployed Starbugs on their telescope in Australia, on the Taipan instrument. And one of the lessons learned is that the Starbugs perform best if you can give them a gravity invariant environment where they're pointed downwards. The Starbugs roam around on a, uh, on a glass field plane. After the fourth mirror reflection, we go up into our positioning system. There is a service wrap which acts as our field derotator, and then we make the jump over to our spectrograph where we split into the in the four color channels. There's a onboard calibration system that's needed for Phobos. So um, the Keck dome takes about 15 minutes to close. They have a dome screen but uh, they're not allowed to do calibrations with the dome open. So it's, it's an agreement on Mauna Kea to, to, to keep light pollution down. So uh, one of the tricks with fiber instrumentation is to make sure that you take your calibrations at the same stress state of the fibers as your observation is going to be. This is to make sure that uh, the fibers you're using for sky subtraction are, are, well, are well characterized. Uh, so we, to do the, to do uh, observation, Sorry, we take calibrations at the stress state of the fibers. We rotate our fourth mirror backwards uh, to face our calibration system. And Ren Bin Yan has designed this uh, projection system, which delivers a uh, something that looks a lot like the Keck pupil 
to the to the fibers, and that allows us to do calibrations in about two minutes. So the operating uh, sequence for Phobos, we will move our fibers into their observing position for the next field. Uh, that takes a minute or so. There's a there's a fiber viewing camera that uh, that locks a kind of iterative loop on the fiber position to make sure that they're moved to the correct place in the field. Uh, we will swing the fourth mirror around, take our calibrations, and then when the fourth mirror comes back to looking at the telescope, we're ready to observe. Uh, the Keck telescope takes about two minutes to get to the average field and to settle. So uh, this, the overhead of calibrations and fiber moving should be about the same as it takes to, to get the telescope where it needs to be. Okay, so these are all of the uh, modules for the, the front end of uh, Phobos. I'm not going to go through them all because I, I think it would probably take too long, uh, but I'll, I'll pick a few key ones out. This is the, the compensating lateral ADC design that we're using. Um, it's easiest, I find, to understand from, from this image. So it's a three element uh, atmospheric dispersion corrector. The blue traces are the null position. So this is looking at zenith. The, the lenses are all uh, coaxial. We take element one of our ADC and we strike it along an arc of 2.4 meters by about 70 millimeters of travel. And what that does is it causes a wedge, a prism between the first surface of uh, element one and the second surface of uh, lens two. And that gives us the amount of correction we need to put the, the, uh, the red light back where the blue light was for the uh, atmospheric correction. We've, we've kind of gravitated to this design for a few reasons. Um, the Keck back focus is not very far from the, the Naismith Journal. And so a, you know, a linear ADC just didn't really have enough room to, to fit. Uh, but it also gives us a number of surfaces that we can put figure on. The Keck telescope delivers a uh, beam at the edge of the field that is nearly parallel to the chief ray of the telescope, but the focal plane of the Keck uh, telescope is quite curved. Fibers need a telecentric input to perform best, uh, and these fibers are required to drive along our, our field plane, which is, which is at focus. So these surfaces of the ADC give us the ability to provide a telecentric input to the, to the fibers, and we're changing the prescription of the CAC telescope to give us the correct beam input for the, for the fiber system. I think that's, that's all I wanted to say about the ADC. In the actual deployment, um, there's the fourth mirror. Okay, so this is the um, Starbug positioning system. This is these are both images from the Taipan instrument. Uh, this is about the same density that is required for Phobos. So the Taipan field of view is oh probably about um, 400 millimeters across, so it's something like this. The Phobos field of view is almost a meter in diameter. So we're looking at the same level of actuator density as on this left-hand view, uh, but the, the number of multiplexing is, is much higher. Uh, AAO thinks that's probably the hardest problem is figuring out how to route all of the utilities they need for their, their actuators. This image on the, uh, the, the right-hand side is viewing the actuators from below the, the focal plane. So you're looking up through the field plane at the bottoms of the actuators. Some of the key design features of these actuators is the leaky vacuum seal. So um, these red rings are each piezo tubes. Uh, they are they each have about they have three zones of actuation in their in their individual piezo tubes, and that allows you to contract the length of that cylinder uh, in any one of those three zones. And because you have two concentric rings of three zone actuators, you can make these kind of block. So the leaky vacuum is to maintain the adherence of this cylinder to the focal plane itself. Uh, this, this system is really what drove us to that fourth mirror in the horizontal focal plane. Patrol zone of each of these actuators is uh, 125 arc seconds. That's not really a limitation of the technology. AAO can, can give you about anything you want in terms of uh, patrol zone of their actuators, but um, Given the density on the field, uh, this was this was a reasonable limit that would give us the right um, makeup of ability to, to get to the targets that we want for Phyllis. 
Okay, so the fiber system, wherever possible, we've tried to use existing technologies that all of us are comfortable with. Um, and we're we're trying to keep the fiber on as short as possible. So FOLUS is really trying to optimize uh, blue transmission. We want to go all the way down to 310 nanometers. At that wavelength, fiber attenuates about a percent per meter. So keeping this 15 meters as short as possible is a is a driver for the design. Um, the other kind of novel thing is this forward optics system that we have to build. The Keck uh, telescope delivers an F15 beam. We need to translate that into about F4, F5 to deliver to the, to the fibers. I'll say more about that, I think, in the next slide. After the uh, forward optics, we go through the Starbucks system. The uh, technique for building these large cable bundles is something that was developed by uh, Durham University. They have built this a few times now. They've built it for PFS, they've built it for DESI, and it, it seems to produce a very nice low stress uh, cable system. We can connect all 600 fibers that go from a single spectrograph in one go. This is a technique that we developed for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. This is an image of the Apogee uh, instrument uh, gang connector where we can, we can plug in a bunch of fibers at one time. So we can swap between modes. Um, currently, Keck thinks that this is a daytime operation, but there's no reason to, you can change modes in, in about a minute. If there was staff on the mountain, they could change modes. And then uh, we feed over the spectrographs where we're using a fairly traditional slit input. Uh, it's, this, is a, this is a slit picture from, I believe this is the DESI slit, actually. So we're going to use something like that. Okay, so about two years ago, we, we came up with this question as to whether it was better to image the focal plane down onto the face of the fibers at a faster F ratio or whether we could get away with uh, just imaging the pupil down onto the face of the fibers. Re-imaging the focal plane requires uh, several optics. These are all very, very small little devices, so the, the optomechanics gets quite challenging. The pupil is quite a bit simpler. Uh, it really only involves one uh, biconvex optic. Um, so we, so we, we tried to build both of these for single fiber terminations, and we built a little bent lens barrel, we bought um, micro optics that we could put onto fibers. And at the end of the day, it was, it was pretty good news. We got about 87% throughput for our lab prototype. And this is what was, this is pretty close to what was predicted from ZMAX. Uh, these are uncoated lenses. The, the transmission of the deployed system will be better than that. Uh, the, the thing that did come out of that is we really couldn't tell the difference between these designs. There wasn't, uh, there wasn't really a difference in the systematics of the, the output performance of the fiber. So currently we're going to baseline the pupil imaging system. And uh, right now, actually, we're, we're building a prototype of the IFU, the 37 fiber IFU with, these, um, with this pupil imaging system. Uh, we're building this primarily as a, a check of how to do the assembly. These, these parts are extremely small. The, the diameter here is about a millimeter across. So we have to design a lot of processes and tooling to figure out how to build up these, these small IFUs. Okay, so I'm going to switch to the, uh, to the back end, the spectrographs. Um, so here's the, here's the spectrograph that, that Rainey's designed for Phobos. We're going to build three of them. They're going to be four channel spectrographs. They operate in, uh, from 310 nanometers out to the micron at resolution 3500. We're using these refractive cameras. Uh, we get to use refractive cameras because we have a relatively small beam size of 140 millimeters. The small beam size is enabled by low numerical aperture fibers. So um, standard telecommunication fibers operate at a numerical aperture of about 0.22. Um, recently, fiber manufacturers have been willing to make fibers of uh, different um, numerical apertures, acceptance angles into the fiber. So we've we've bought a number of these uh, slow slower fibers and tested them in the lab. They're a little more susceptible to stress-induced focal ratio degradation, but uh, we believe we can manage that in careful design with the fiber train. And that gets us to a slower beam coming out of the slit, which allows us to use uh, a much simpler design for the spectrograph. This uh, few silica etch gratings, these are somewhat novel too. I don't know that there's another instrument that's um, used these, although I believe that WFOS has also baselined uh, few silica etch gratings. 
Uh, these are surface relief gratings. So instead of a BPH where you have a, a couple of panels with a, a holographic gel in the center, uh, the company etches um, structure into one side of a fused silica blank, and that gives you the, the diffraction. They are much higher transmission than BPH, and they are also less peaky. So BPHs usually have a very uh, steep transmission curves. These broaden the transmission curve quite a bit. Uh, at the detector, we end up with a 6K by 6K custom detector. Each spectrograph uh, has 600 individual fibers. I'll walk through just one channel quickly. The, the slit is right here in the middle of dichroic one. Uh, I was pretty nervous about this for, for quite a while, but um, uh, Desi, the Desi spectrograph has done this, and uh, Lawrence Berkeley is a, is a partner in the project. So we are going to copy their method for embedding a slit, uh, a, a projection slit into the middle of the dichroic. The beam comes out of the slit, lands on the collimator, and from there it comes back to our first dichroic. We get red in transmission, blue in reflection. And then we come up to our second dichroic where we get UV in reflection and blue in transmission. This is where the few silica edge grading lands, and then we're into our cam. The only mechanical component, uh, moving mechanical component in this system is a, uh, is a shutter, which, which sits right here. Other than that, the spectrograph is completely static. You take the dichroic and you cut a slot in it, and you slide the slit into the background, which sounds a bit crazy. Uh, but Desi did it successfully, so we think we can. Yeah. The main problem is that you don't have a lot of pupil relief back here. So because we end. Yeah, right. So it's calling it light. So you lose, you have to put a baffle here uh, to baffle out imperfections of that of that cup. But on a on a um, on an on-axis slit like this, you always have a baffle down the center of your collimator anyway. So we lose an extra percent or two due to that cut in the bank product. Um, the, the main problem is right here. You have to have some depth to the slit to make sure that the fibers don't bend too tight. And uh, there's just not a lot of, of depth back here to, uh, to put in the slit. Okay, so here's everybody's favorite curve. This is the transmission curve uh, you're expecting for Phobos. These top two curves are the instrument only. They don't include the telescope. The difference in the, uh, the dashed line and the yellow line is the, is the QE of the detectors. So E2V um, claims they will give you a gradiated coating. So one of the nice things about a fiber spectrograph is that the same wavelength of light lands on the same position of the detector uh, for every observation. And that allows you to optimize the AR coating for uh, that particular wavelength at that location of the detector. So um, E2V is going to give us this, uh, this fancy coating that really gives us the best UV transmission we can get. Uh, there's some of us that are pretty skeptical that um, that's going to be, that we can afford that. So uh, the worst case is this, uh, is this yellow curve for the instrumental transmission, and it's a little bit worse in the, uh, in the blue. Uh, if you include the telescope, this is the, the expected full system transmission for Phobos. So, including telescope, we're at about 40% uh, transmission for the vast majority of the pass band, and we dip down at the blue and the red, as, as you might expect. Mm -hmm. So, timeline for Phobos. Uh, we're currently, we finished our conceptual design review uh, last year. We're currently in our preliminary design phase, which we expect to end in about 2025. Uh, and then we're going to final design and fabrication. Fabrication is expected to end around 2029. And we will be commissioning by the by the end of the decade. Uh, this, this is all funding contingent, but we expect that we'll be able to make, maintain this schedule. Okay, I think that's that's where I want to stop. Um, I, I put in some contact information for the Phobos PI Kevin Bundy and project scientist uh, Kyle Westfall in case you want more detailed information. I'm also happy to answer questions about both these instruments. And then on scales, uh, Andy Schemer, the PI in Santa Cruz, uh, someone you can contact. And uh, with Andrew Banyal here is, uh, is also uh, the, the local PI for scales. So thank you.
How is the diffraction taken care of? Is that the question? Yeah, so the lens load array is a it's a lens load array on one side and a pinhole grid on the back side. That pinhole grid acts as the mask for the diffraction. Yeah, so in low resolution, we just have a set of prisms in the carousel that uh, would give us just kind of a moderate dispersion. I was wondering what Science based approach for this. Uh, is it already there? So, science. Is it a survey based science? Or? It's not a survey machine. So, um, <laughs> Phobos is, is at its heart a, uh, a, a facility workhorse instrument. It's the science case that any PI that comes to check has. We're expected to be able to fill. The, uh, in the in the visible way, um, we've put together a number of uh, kind of key science cases to try and you know, set the, the parameters for what we're going to design. And those typically, it's easier to design those more around some survey that you like to do. Um, the selling point of Phobos is that it is it is it is blue and it's deep. So as opposed to say PFS, which is on the same mountain. PFS is a field of view, which I think is about a degree in, in diameter. Uh, Phobos is right about the same number of fibers constrained to a 20 arc field of view. So the idea behind Phobos is that you go to a much, much fainter uh, regime in terms of the targets. Um, there's an entire talk in here about the Phobos science cases, which we can, we can talk about later, but I'm definitely the wrong person to ask about science. So the well, it's going to take a while to do this thing. Yeah, the, the the curvature ends up being probably fifty millimeters from center to edge, uh, and that's the reason that we ended up with that ADC design was to uh, give us a telecentric input at the edge fibers because uh, the keck. Keck is very similar to TMT in its optical design. And so the, the edge beam is nearly parallel to the chamber. Plug these. So that that curvature. Uh, oh, up. This curvature here is the, uh, is the curvature of the field. It's not quite as bad as TMT, but it's it's not, it's not it's good. Good. The fibers move along that arc. They, they just travel along and blast it. So then, children which are at edges, is it like the normal experience? Or? Yeah, they're, they're not quite at the edges. They, uh, they're they allowed to patrol the entire field. So the, sorry, let's just do this. Um, Fibers come down, there's a rack in the back, they, they all come down, they land anywhere on the focal plane, and then they patrol a patch of, of their area. So you're looking up through the field plate in, the, in this right image here to the bottoms of the, of the fibers. And that could be on axis, and anywhere in the field, you'll look up through the field plate next to this. So your slip was right in the middle of the fiber. No. So the fibers will be block some some light like, 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 But that will only block one of the arms, like some of the No, it's all the arms. Um, oh. yeah. It's unfortunate. That's it's a so the um the fibers will be coming down from the top of this view and the slit plate sits right here. So they'll they'll come down from the top and then they'll take a turn uh in the plane but they project that towards the column and the paper. And you need to either put a baffle through the, just right through the center of the column. So you get you move, get that loss on all channels. It's not so bad though. It's, it's, but I think you don't use the same fibers, right? Like for all the two Yes, fibers. same fibers. So yeah. how do you, how do you configure? So Kex, 
position is that we're only going to reconfigure during the day. So we will, so the observer will go up to the observing deck before the night starts and they will set the configuration of Phobos for that night. And maybe MOS, and maybe IFUs. So just that only, one for the day. only one, only one configuration. You can mix modes. So you can have, you can have the fiber, the three, all three spectrographs set to a different mode. One could be a fixed IFU, one could be a MOS IFU, and one could be zoning uh, single fibers. Um, but once you fix it for the night, you stay fixed. So Keck is trying to move towards a model where there's not people in the dome at night, which is a good idea because it's high altitude and things like that. So we we have ideas on how we could automate this, uh, but we're not we're not claiming it as a baseline. Uh, I'm pretty sure at some point it'll be automated so you can switch it. So he's not been what? Uh, so it's about a hundred and um, thirty arc seconds. It's uh, let me see, it's right. Yeah, it's a hundred and twenty-five arc seconds per actuator. Which is quite a lot. You see. Oh. The so the, see this bend right here. This uh, this bend is the limit on how far the actuator can move from its kind of neutral position, uh, and it's. It's a it's a really complicated software problem that uh, that I, AAO has figured out how to deal with. Okay. This question is the piezo addition of two beams. Oh yeah yeah yeah. It's very That's, it walks. Right, it walks. So it's uh, you can you can think of it going like this, uh, and they it's, it moves quite fast. It's um, you know, it's I mean it can move you know 100 millimeters in you know. 15, 20 seconds at, at full speed. They send a they send a uh, triangular wave to each of the piezos, and so they're 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 kind of well, they're sending these these waves continuously, and you get a you get a fast motion. The step size is very small; it's like four microns. So you take thousands and thousands of steps to get to position. Yeah. Um, so Keck is has a I think a two year proprietary period. Is that all right? Yeah. Right. So it depends on it depends on where you're getting the time from. NASA time is probably immediately. Yeah. So we have percent Keck. I'm not sure on the percentage. She's talking about something. Like that. About twenty percent of CAC time goes to the community. Uh, that all the observations that are taken there. Are I believe the proprietary period for PI data is two years, and after that, all CAC data is public. You can download CAC data now if you want. Um, there is a initiative within Phobos to try and do a better job of uh, serving that data. So. Sloan does a does a very good job of making the data available in a, in a searchable way. Um, the CAC system is probably not as not as advanced, but they'd like it to be. So I think that through Phobos, you'll see all CAC data become somewhat more accessible after its proprietary period is done. Uh, currently, CAC is closed. It's it's uh, it's within the uh, the CAC consortium. Lots of people find ways to get time on CAC by partnering. Um, you know, like uh, IAA is going to get time on on scales by joining the scale science team. So, if you had significant interest in, in Phobos, you could join the, the Phobos science team, and then time comes through the through the normal TAC competition. Is that right? Yes. yes. Yeah, that's, so my my interest in Phobos is really this focal plane. Um, so this 
this system um, is feeding optical spectrographs right now. The fiber positioning system and the, and the ADC are available for any future instrumentation upgrade. So one of the things we've already talked about is there's a um, there's a radial velocity instrument that's going to deliver to CAC fairly soon called uh, CAC Planet Finder. And this uses a, uh, a fiber, a scene limited fiber. Uh, there's no reason you couldn't put a CAC Planet Finder fiber into this spectrograph. It operates at H band, it would get decent transmission through our ADC, and that would add one extra instrument to the, to the Phobos suite. There's a, it was an IR workshop at Keck um, a couple of months ago, and there was a lot of interest in trying to have an IR upgrade for Phobos. So you'd have spectrographs that would live in the basement and run their fibers up to the exact same focal point. So that's, that's actually what I'm most excited about, is that once you build the front end, you can think about all kinds of interesting things to do with it in the future. Yeah, so it's a, um, so, see it's around here. I pushed the calibration out because I was running out of time. I lost it. Um, so the calibration system is a, is, is lamps projecting down onto a screen that emits the pupil. And then you get the version, the version scattering off of that screen, which goes to a Fresnel lens. It's a plastic Fresnel lens, uh, which then uh, focuses the light to a uh, to an input that looks a lot like the F15 CAC-D, and it covers the full focal length. So, uh, and then yeah, it's uh, it's uh, a bit similar to SLSST, except I think they're using they're directly projecting the light to the telescope. So they have. I think they're using like a structured uh, diffuser in front of their lamps, and that gives them a direct beam. We have to reflect off of that. The screen is located uh, kind of in in the um, so the screen is located right here. So lamps are projecting that off the screen and back towards the towards the lens. Rinden is buying one of these from lens. It was a smaller version. They set it up a lab to to make sure that the uh, the pupil of illumination is is going to be it's not particularly strict. We need to get something like a five percent pupil uniformity, which is not particularly hard to get to. <laughs> Try to do pupil in this year. Yeah. The main driver for people imaging is that it's much easier mechanically to, to build in those. So you'll, you'll need a biconvex lens in the brain, and then uh, you can put that directly down on the fiber pulse. So the mechanical interface becomes simple. There's some other advantages in that the, the pupil is now what's landing on the detector, and pupil typically is more stable than, say, the, the focal plane input. Uh, so we think we might get some uh, sky subtraction benefits from doing that. Uh, but there's more more simulation to see that's uh, to be real. It's probably lower at three Um Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> well, so we were originally worried that um, we would be projecting some unstable beam to our grading, which would give us some systematics so that we wouldn't be able to control. So far, tests show that it's not, it's not that good. Yeah, um, I don't think we're publishing the cost, but it's, uh, it's not a cheap instrument. It's, it's, it's comparable to other instruments of its kind, PFS, DESI. Mossfire is significantly more than Mossfire. So it's a, it's a, big, it's a big project for, for us. Uh, that, that partnership list will certainly grow uh, substantially as we go through the process. I think so, yeah. Thank you.